This is a fourth Sunday in regards with uh, praying for the persecuted church. We still have materials out there on a table, except instead of right by the door, it's to the right, closer to uh, where the nursery is. You're welcome to pick those materials up, and then they will be gone for the year. But uh, you can subscribe to a free year of um, Voice of the Martyrs magazine. I did want to tell you about a, one of the stories, that uh, video that we showed, which is really hard to watch um, before we pray. It was in Colombia. No, there, no, I mean, there's no video, right? Yeah. It was a video that we played several years ago. Watch the back folk get panicked when I talked about a video that we don't have playing today. I'm sorry. I was, no, it was a video we watched many, many years ago uh, when we did it. But uh, it was uh, just wanted to briefly capsulize this. It was pretty rough because it was... Um, Several Christians on a work bus, and they got pulled over by guerrilla soldiers in Colombia. They ordered everyone off uh, the bus, had them kneel down on the side of the road. There's 28 people. And uh, they were all yelling for them to shut up, shut up, and they all had rifles. And, and one of the gentlemen um, started singing and worshiping God. Just closing his eyes, just worshiping Jesus. Told him, shut up, shut up, shut up took out a pistol and just shot him in the head, slumped over. And there's people crying and going, like, this is going to be it. And they just started just to mow everybody down. It was a true story that happened. And uh, 28 people lay there. What is interesting is they went around to make sure that everybody was dead. If they were moving, they would actually shoot them again to make sure that they were dead. This particular brother lay down there motionless, and was still alive. He was the only guy that survived. He was the guy that was singing. Later on, the, these guerrilla soldiers ended up being arrested, put in jail, and this particular brother went to see the murderers who were actually captured in jail. Led Bible studies with them, led several of them to the Lord, and got to baptize uh, one particular guy who shot him. And he was still in prison, and there's film of them together, and basically what happened is he got shot in the side temple, took out, took out his eye, but he did not die. And he didn't receive a second shot, which gave him the opportunity to go to jail to love on these people in the name of Jesus. That's what persecution can look like, to actually love those who are enemies. And that's what Jesus did. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. From the cross, as he was nailed to a cross. Our example is Jesus. And there's many, many stories like this in Voice of the Martyrs, actual real people. And so we pray for those people to, that their witness would not fade, that they would not shrink back, that they would be bold and share the love of Jesus and continue to be increasing in their faith. And that's why we get to pray. That's why we get to pray in a place like this to pray for our brothers and sisters. So if you would join me. Thank you, God, for examples like Guillermo who loved, loved those who shot and killed so many people that he was there with on that bus that day. And yet, because of your grace and your great love and your great example, showed him how to actually love people in the name of Jesus who were murderers of so many of his friends that day. To love unconditionally and for people then to be moved at what a great God this must be, what a great faith this must be, that you would choose to love those who would bring you harm, that you would choose to love and to share this glorious good news with people who so desperately need it. Lord, we pray for the church to increase, give them strength, increase their faith. Lord, we do ask that you protect them. But more importantly, as we talk about this topic today, we pray that you protect their hearts and guard their hearts so that they would love you no matter what this life brings. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so this is the fourth part of a series uh, that we are, I'm, I'm gathering from uh, a book called The Slumber of Christianity. By Ted Decker. And so, talking about living to die today. 
and uh, it's not always a pleasant topic, not always fun to talk about, but it is actually a part of life here on this fallen planet. So we'll get started off on the right foot. There's a story that goes, our neighbor's cat was run over by a car, and the mother quickly disposed of the remains before her four-year-old son, Billy, found out about it. And after a few days, though, Billy finally asked about the cat. Billy, the cat died, his mother explained, but it's all right, he's up in heaven with God. The boy asked, what in the world would God want with a dead cat? <laughs> I mean, you got to start light before we get too heavy, right? So here's some tombstone, tombstone inscriptions. The first one I'm sure you've heard many, many times before, but I still like it. It's just so good to repeat. Here lies Lester Moore. Four slugs from a 44. No less, no more. That's classic. You just can't beat that one. From Lincoln, Maine, underneath this pile of stones lies all that's left of Sally Jones. Her name was Briggs. It was not Jones, but Jones was used to rhyme with stones. I like that one. And classic. This, this kid only, as Chess would say, only in America. Um, from Schenectady, New York, here lies Jane Smith, wife of Thomas Smith, marble cutter. This monument was erected, and I'm sure, John, you're going to like this one as well, being a monument man. The, this monument was erected by her husband as a tribute to her memory and a specimen of his work. Monuments of the same style, $350. <laughs> we'll keep on going. That's only page one. Sometimes we take death lightly because we are scared or terrified or even intimidated by it. One of the reasons for the obsessions of the fear of death, apart from God, is how elevated our earthly lives are. The elevation of this earthly life can actually be very intimidating to know, wow, this is really, really good. This is pretty sweet. I don't want this to end. And so it can even happen to Christians. Remember how excited you were when you first surrendered to Jesus? As your Lord and your Savior, you actually had enthusiasm. There was an excitement. And you may have thought, or unfortunately even were taught, that now that you're a Christian, your business will now succeed, or your marriage will be better or more successful, and that your wealth may even increase. And the truth has always been that Jesus came to save our souls, not our bank accounts. Slowly we become influenced and we're convinced by the world that God seems detached from all these things that we could, that he seems to ignore. We thought that becoming a Christian, things would get better around us, that things would improve. Now that I'm a Christian, it's new improved Bruce, a Bruce 2.0 or something. And so we become disillusioned, we become detached from these things that, that should have improved, and then we eventually substitute Christianity for good music, a really good speaker, dynamic youth and children's programs, good food, friendships, road road trips, different projects to get involved in. And we become less and less enamored with those things, and Christianity then can turn to boredom, leth lethargy, and even unbelief. And Decker says this, no Christianity stripped of hope can either satisfy nor last. The good news is that any slumber can be awakened. And I don't know where at, and any of you may be in this particular journey of going, oh, hum, this journey of Jesus it happens because life can suck away joy. It can take away the idea of really enjoyment of what he's given us for this temporary time here. The good news is we can all be awakened. Because as long as, I've said this many times, as long as you've got breath, there's opportunity for repentance. There's opportunity for change. And the truth is, number one, we were born to die. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Eve. Uh, we can blame, blame them all we want, but that's all part of the process that we get from their time in the garden. I was just at a memorial at a home last week. There will be another one this Saturday. And Angel just went to be with Jesus. 
Death seems so close and all around us sometimes. And I think it is truly a truth that death reminds us of our own mortality. Every time we're at one of those events, we're reminded, oh, I won't live forever here on this planet. And Jesus said this in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, here's an interesting thing. If Jesus actually said, which I believe he did, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, then why do many of us as Christians see their faith as a burden and the load's way too heavy to carry? And I think a lot of it has to do not only with our faith in Jesus, but it has to do with our theology of death. Some Christians may have a misguided theology. Still others have an expectation of earthly promise or earthly fulfillment. You know, when we pray and something doesn't happen, it's a very interesting thing how our faith gets redirect it by saying, well, I have been praying for this for 25, 30 years, and yet it seems it has fallen on deaf ears. Is God even care? Is God existent? Is, is he even involved in anything that's important to me? And we can look at this with a very me-centered view and be very disillusioned by God. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And again, I think not only sometimes do we have a misguided theology on death, I think sometimes we maybe don't have any theology on death. So there's a simple question. Do you want to die or do you want to live? Now, before you answer so quickly, do you want to die or do you want to live? If you're a Christian, you think maybe there's supposed to be an answer I'm supposed to say, but the logical question, if uh, the logical answer, if I could say it, of course I want to live. Most of you would say that without hesitation. So if you're a Christian, then how do you answer that question? The logical one is, yes, I want to live. But then the next question is, how then will we really live? And, of course, I thought about two books for reference points. One is Francis Schaeffer, How Should We Then Live? It's a great book if you really like big words and reading really slow. Or if you're really smart, you'd probably gobble this up in an hour. But it's an amazing book. It's very deep, very heavy. Francis Schaeffer, How Then Should We Live? Of course, Charles Colson, not to borrow or copy that name, said, How Now Shall We Live? How now, brown cow? How shall we live? Uh, Charles Colson. It was a really good one. Um, it's a little bit more easier to read, but still a very good, good, good book. Much thicker. But anyway, those are two, two books I, I recommend. And even on processing that question, then how should we live? The truth is that we are truly living after we die to Christ. That's when living really begins. Now, I know that that sounds like no duh. As Christians, of course we die to ourselves. But do we really die to ourselves? It, over and over, Paul's writings are all about this. And it's clear, I believe, that we have to have a good theology on death, or at least above average one, so that we know how to live well while dead to self. It's a very paradoxical thing, this idea of Christianity. I'm dead, but I'm fully alive. I am dead to myself, but I will be fully alive even now as I am dead. I live to die. I and dying so that Christ can live in me, so that I can live eternally. The idea of this death and dying is such a mixture of things. Because we're into self-preservation. We are. You know, you get your finger close to the eye, it's going to blink. You want to bring a fist up like that, and you want to get it closer to me, well, other people will duck, other people will do something else. <laughs> in the room. I know you guys. So there is a reaction that can happen because we have this, you put somebody under the water. You want to come up and you want to breathe. It is the natural way God has made us. But this, this question of the soul, this question of the heart is a lot deeper, I believe, than just physical survival. 
Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 1 through 2. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. Yea, Solomon. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. <laughs> it's a very interesting phrasing that he writes in Ecclesiastes. There's an interesting thing that I found this, this last week. Sometimes I actually do too much research and find stuff that I shouldn't find. And one of them was this. Um... It is called the World Death Clock. Per year, at least estimated this year, 56 million people will die. Per month, that is 4.7 million. Per day, that's 153,000 in the world. 153,000 round numbers. Per hour, 6,400. Per minute, 107. And per second, 2. Then they do something really amazing on this world clock. They have a rolling number. It's very interesting to look at a number that continues to roll going, those are real people in the world. Something happens when you get people's names on you and you hear stories like Guillermo and you hear stories like somebody that you really, oh, this was personal. Why? I knew them. But when you're looking at numbers, they can be very plain. They can be very, it's just numbers. But here's the interesting thing about this. The people, I don't know, was it 70-some people that died in the hurricane? Hurricane-related in Florida or Lee County, something around that number. It was over 100 in Florida. But around the 70, those people had not planned on dying that day. It wasn't part of the agenda to go, you know, I'm really feeling sick. And today when this hurricane comes and I drown or whatever happens to me, this day, I'm just planning on not being around anymore. Most people are not in a position to be able to go, this is my plan. I've got it all mapped out. When our dear little sister was having dinner with her friend Maria and just put on her dancing shoes... I hadn't planned that night just to go home. The deal is, you don't know when your last day is. Now, this is not supposed to be depressing because most of you guys know Jesus in here. So we're, we're amongst friends right now that I can speak like this. You know how this wouldn't be really fun if it was full of people who didn't know Jesus. It just it has a different vibe to it. Why are you being so negative? Why are you being so dark? The deal is, we're just not planning on this. But here's the difference. For those of us in Jesus, this is very interesting why Solomon would say this. For death is the destiny of every person. The living should take this to heart. To, to know that it's definitely going to come. And then to live in a way to know, I don't know how, if I'm going to have one day or if I'm going to have 17 more years. To live in that way. And we always talk about that in Christianity. The idea, you never know. This could be our last day. Sometimes it's used as like fear tactics and throwing little smoke bombs. To, oh, got my attention. You know, you just never know. But it's interesting when we know people and we go, oh, that wasn't a plan. That's really oh, it's so sudden. It's so surprising. In D. Stewart's Briscoe's book, Spirit Life, he writes, When I moved to the United States, I was impressed, I think it was from England, with the number of total strangers who visit my home to wish me well. They all sold insurance. <laughs> One day, my visitor was talking to me about the necessity to be prudent in the preparation for all possibilities. He said, if something should happen to you, Mr. Briscoe, he started to say, but I interrupted. Please don't say that. It upsets me. He was startled. But he, he tried again. But with all due respect, sir, we must be ready if something should happen to us. Don't say that, I insisted, Briscoe says. He looked totally bewildered, and I said, I don't understand what I said to upset you. Then I'll tell you. It upsets me that you talk about life's only certainty as if it is a possibility. Death isn't a possibility. 
It's a certainty. You don't say if when, you say when. Whenever death is the subject, not if, but when you die. And he tells this insurance gentleman, this is, I want you to understand this. And so as a believer, it's really important to be able to understand this is all part of this. But again, the reality is we're not surprised. Why? Because I'm ready today. I'm ready if the Lord calls me today. So this is a difference on how we live. You know, you look at these titles, these two books, how then should we live? We live today like it's our last. T today is a gift from God. And you know what's interesting is we typically do that when we really lose people that we love going, oh, what do I need to do? Hug my kids tighter. Spend more time. Oh, I could spend more time at the office, but things have changed for me. You know, oh, I could work more. I could be more isolated, but things are different now. Why? Because time is precious. Time is a gift. Life is a gift. And so therefore, then how do I live? Especially, it's interesting when you go, you've got one month to live. Maybe three weeks. How then do you live? Would it be any different than what you choose to do right now when you don't know? And that's the beauty of what we get to choose to do. Knowing that life is precious here, but it's not all there is. Number two, in living, we die. In living, we die, but in dying, we truly live. So sometimes I am bewildered by how we have a hard time in talking about death in our conversations. I think it's our culture's obsession with pleasure and happiness, quite honestly. It's kind of too much to lose by going too soon. We gloss over death because life is so precious here. We actually have this, as I said earlier, this inflated idea of our earthly life. It becomes so more relevant, so much more important that the idea of eternity is, no, 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 not yet. It's a very interesting concept. And so as I bizarrely think about this and share these things with you from the text, um, let's go ahead and continue to have fun. When someone dies, we often soften the blow by saying something like this. If, you, if you've said it, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that we say things like, well, they're in a better place now, right? Or at least they're not suffering anymore. Now, while these statements are true, they're generally meant more as an intention on easing the pain and the sorrow of death over the obsession and the motivation and the joy towards heaven. You can see the difference. And it's, it's, again, it's not meant to be critical. It's just how we talk sometimes to try to be nice and be easing as opposed to the celebration of angels' home. That's a different, different mindset. And sure, we miss her. Of course we miss her. But that's all part of the hope that we have in Christ. And then we're going we're gonna to be together one day. But this isn't over. This little temporary thing that we've called life, this dot on the map of eternity that we call our lifespan, that dot, should be seen with perspective and the obsession and the motivation and the joy towards heaven. And when we many times speak of eternity, we use it more of as a salve or an ointment or a balm to be able to go, but at least there's eternity. So, you know, as opposed to our actual goal, our motivation. This is what we live for, to live with Jesus forever with his body. And that's what we get to look forward to. Now, and I'm not saying that we should rush to get there. You know, there is a thing called drinking your greens and drinking your beets and all the other stuff that you do. Taking your vitamins and eating plenty of fiber, etc., and sometimes exercising. <laughs> so, what should we think about? Philippians 4.8. You know this verse. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Everything here is, de is v devoted and focused upon a God view. Everything here. 
Now, apart from God, you, you can say, oh, those are beautiful mountains. That's really, that's really, but who are you giving praise to? Typically, if you don't give it to God, you give it to either your own eyes or, wow, those are beautiful mountains. I, I, if you ever watched Alone, where they do that, where, where they'll be getting a, a fish or they catch an animal or something, and they'll say, thank you, animal. Thank you for providing me this, this food. And so it's interesting, or they'll just look around and say, just thank you for this animal. And you just, you're just looking around at the idea of, of where our focus is. It's an interesting thing. But the idea of whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy, excellent, the things that those think about all give points, uh, a direction to God. And may I say, especially the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the centerpiece of our faith. That's why we see crosses all over the place. That's why we remember what he did on the cross. The fear of death, I believe, is more a part of the fall than from God. The enemy Satan has turned death and fear into something of horror. This note was found in John and Betty Stam's very unknown, not well-known missionary couple from China. They found this in their stuff. It was a note. It said, Afraid? You know, because the idea, if you go to China, it's you know, pretty hard to be a Christian, be a missionary there, because it may be harmful to you. You may be put in prison. You may, go to, you may get killed. So anyway, they found this note after they passed. Afraid? Afraid of what? To feel the Spirit's glad release? To pass from pain to perfect peace? The strife and strain of life to cease? Afraid of that? Afraid of what? Afraid to see the Savior's face? To hear His welcome and to trace... The glory gleaned from wounds of grace. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? A flash, a crash, a pierced heart darkness, light? Oh, heaven's art, a wound of his, a counterpart. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? To do by death what life could not? Baptized with blood, a stony plot, till souls shall blossom from this spot. Afraid of that? Eh, what a cool note. If you avoid the issue of your intimate death, then it is easy then to avoid the talk of heaven. Because they seem to go hand in hand. Because death is the portal. It's the transition to heaven. So I'm going to wax just very, not eloquently, but wax just a little bit. I'll wax on, maybe. A little bit about the simple theology of death. The New Testament has a dozen or so references to death, and when death is mentioned, it is typically and usually only referring to the second death. Typically. One of the classic references is Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 through 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake, the lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The first death, we all know, is what? What we talk about, physical death. And it was not even a major concern to the early church. Not much. As a matter of fact, some of them knew that this was not going to be a very long life if they were going to choose to follow Jesus. So the first death, you don't see a whole lot of writing in there. The second death was a much more concerned for the church and was what was warned about and written about and to what we are saved from. Romans 7, 24, who will rescue me from this body of death? Spiritual death was a thing to be feared more than physical death. Paul wrote a lot on this subject. He wrote about this spiritual death being overcome or conquered only by the death of Jesus. Romans 6, 2 through 7, we died to sin. You guys know this verse. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism, into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, he goes on to say, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, because anyone who has died has been free from sin. Now, when you look at the rest of this deal here, if I go 8, 9, and 10, look how he seals the deal. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. 
For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died once to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now, Paul refers to this as a spiritual death. There's not much mentioned about physical death. So when you look at the text, uh, I would encourage you, uh, even after today, because I can't do all of uh, chapter 15 out of 1 Corinthians. It's a great study. I mean, it's one to bury yourself in. It's just a beautiful text about the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of our bodies. So I'm just going to briefly close with a couple of verses out of here, out of chapter 15. Uh, the first one I'm going to look at is 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. It says, do you know our physical death hasn't been destroyed? It's coming, right? And so Jesus didn't go onto the cross so you could live forever here in this particular archaic decaying body. He didn't go to the cross so you can live forever here. That curse is already, that's part of what we live with from the garden. But what he did was the second death, that's what he came to save us from. Go down to verse 35. Again, I'd like you to read all of chapter 15 at some time. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Now, it's a very interesting question when Paul uses, well, someone might say, um, obviously somebody's probably said it, maybe multiple times, so he comes up with this question. But then what he says is, what? How foolish. How foolish. It, it, they didn't say really, that's a dumb thing to say, but it was, it was close by saying foolish. You fool. You f that was a foolish thing to say. Paul is basically saying that your concern over the body is foolish. Well, what, what will happen to this? Really? That's your concern? After everything that he's written about, everything that Jesus has died for on the cross, this is what you're concerned about. And he basically says, this is foolish to even think about. Why do you care about this body? And then he goes on in verse 37. He says this, When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. See, Paul is saying that if you want to plant something, and you want to make a tree, you don't plant a tree. Okay, that makes sense. I want corn, so I will plant a whole stock of corn in the ground. No. He says you plant a seed. What happens to the seed? It dies. So that something else can come out. And so unless it's planted and dies, it won't produce or live. A seed planted then dies, then produces something much more wonderful than the seed. Isn't that a good thing? that our bodies, who are now called in this text a seed, is not what we live for, the seed, but we live for something much better. That if we die, Paul goes on to say, verse, if you read 37 through 49 too, but again, I'm saying all of 15. I'm not going to read 37 through 49. There's really, really good meaty text here. But I'm going to skip down to 50. Again, this is just highlights of chapter 15. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He's basically saying, don't worry about the seed. Don't worry about this perishable thing here. Now, yes, we're supposed to be good maintainers. We're supposed to be good stewards of what God's given us. But again, it's only a temporary thing that we're taking care of this vessel. That's why he calls it a tent in 2 Corinthians. He calls it a tent. And it, it will perish. So our investment into this thing here is a short-term return. It, it's a short return. No long-term return. You can, you can put all kinds of money into this thing, and it doesn't have a long-term investment. We know that. And it's not, again, I want to repeat, it's not that we don't take care of this temporary earthly temple. But ultimately, that's not the goal. He continues on, uh, verse 55. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Paul once again is saying, you fools, don't you realize the truth of the sting of death is sin? He says that earlier in the text. Spiritual death is a much bigger deal than the seed we call the human body. And when you look at the fall in the garden with Adam and Eve, the promise of death for disobedience did include physical death. 
they had a lifespan. In other words, on the earth and in the, when they got kicked out, of it, they did have an end coming now. They originally didn't have that. But now there is this end. But what happened deeper, we know this. They lost intimacy with God. They had perfect union with God because that not only were they eternal beings, but there was something that, that when he says, if you and when you with this fruit, you will surely die. It's really interesting that a curse of death in a place where there is no death is a weird promise. If you touch it, like, like what do you mean die? Like, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense when there is no death. But not only did physical death come, but separation from God. And what did he do right there in 315? Oh, my goodness. I've already got a plan for someone to come in between the enemy, the snake, the, the viper himself, and you. The very thing Job asked for. There is going to be someone. And you're going to bite his heel. But he's going to crush your head, Satan. And that is what my promise to you. It may not come right away, but I'll keep on prophesying about it so you'll continue to prepare for the time, the very perfect time when Jesus would come. And so we, only, we now needed a Savior. Why? To save us from physical death? No. That's not the sting of death. That's normal. That's a seed being put in the ground. But from the second death, which is hell. Number three, there is no fear in physical death. I urge you to read all of 15. I think it's, it's a really, really good read. So, no fear in physical death. We don't fear our mortal bodies stopping. But we should fear spiritual death. Unless you know Jesus, then you have no more fear. You got no more fear of normal death, and you, got no more, you have no fear of spiritual death. It, it's, it's win-win. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who can kill... This is Jesus' words, red letter. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Be afraid rather of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's clear. Ted Decker said this, and I really wanted to emphasize this. I know it seems like it doesn't fit right here, but I really wanted to emphasize it. He said, evil should be painted with the blackest of brushes, not for fear's sake, but for distinguishing from truth. One of the things that we talk about, whether it's sin or evil, and the reason I say this is we've just come off the idea of Halloween. Well, you know, you know the text, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He's a deceiver, he's a liar, and he's our only enemy. He's a deceiver when it comes to sin. He's a deceiver when it comes to truth, from Jesus, death. And when we buy into the lies of darkness, we are complicit with evil. And so this idea of celebrating, now made horror movies. I mean, the way that sometimes we celebrate evil and darkness. And I know that when, we, when they get into entertainment, I think that's a lot more deceptive to be able to go, wait, no, no, I'm paying good money for entertainment. And you're just like, man, he's a deceiver. The idea of celebrating anything that celebrates and elevates it, Satan, we should have nothing to, I mean... When we see stuff and go, well, that's not a bad, I mean, I've, I've been a Christian for a long time. That stuff doesn't really bother me. Or, and we start to do this where we say, it's just, you know, it's just part of the, you know, our culture and stuff. Like, so I don't mean to be one of these, like, step on everything. And somebody that sounds kind of like my grandfather. But the deal is, the text is very clear on associating and dealing and accepting anything that has to do with darkness. And if it doesn't match up with the truth of God, it doesn't, it doesn't honor God. And so I just don't want to be a part of that. And there are times when I have been complicit with that in my life, and I don't want to be. So, here's the promise once again. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That's not physical death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. There is sorrow that comes with death. Can't bypass it. When we love deeply, our emotions go with that. 
So we should not be sorry for going, you know, I just don't really feel right. I don't, I don't feel good. I feel bad. This still hurts my heart. And when I look at this picture, I think of this memory. There's something that's missing. Totally normal. Elaine just talked about it, I think, was with your mother the other day or something. They were just talking or and just saying, oh, I just saw something. Or I had a memory or I had a thought, and I just really missed her today. And this is just normal. It's just really just normal. But when we miss them and grieve them, it's different from worldly sorrow. Amen. Worldly sorrow without Jesus leaves us hopeless and leaves nothing, and it ends at death. It's over. It's all there is. You got nothing else. You should be sad. You should be miserable. Because death ends, I mean... That's it. There's no more. Paul said it this way. And it's better to read Bible than just listen to my words. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. There you go. That's what you get. Worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. There is no fear. Godly sorrow is embraced because we know Eternal salvation awaits. Heaven with Jesus is forever. This is all part of the death story of the believer in Jesus. It's what we get to walk in right now and when it happens. It's a different way of living, I'm telling you. It's not that we're morbid and cavalier about death. That's not the point. The point is we don't see it as a fear point. We don't see it as an end. Godly sorrow. Leads to repentance. John Climacus, a 7th century aesthetic who wrote Ladder of Divine Ascent, urged Christians to use the reality of death to their benefit. He wrote this, You cannot pass a day devote, devoutly and let... Devotely or devoutly? Oh, you. Devoutly. You cannot pass a day devoutly unless you think of it as your last. He, he wrote... He called the thought of death. You know, even Christians think sometimes this is weird. He, he thought of death as the most essential of all works and a gift from God. The man who lives daily with the thought of death is to be admired, and the man who gives himself to it by the hour is surely a saint. Now, the only way that you get there, if you just leave that sentence by itself, you think, what a weirdo, right? It's like, what? What is the guy thinking? Like, hey, he's just like all obsessed with death. You know, he's kind of like that. Uh, that was a long movie. He wouldn't get it. Anyway, so if some things pass through my mind and they just should just keep on moving along. Anyway, so this, this idea of being admired for thinking of death means that we have an actual understanding of our mortality. We have a proper perspective of what this life is supposed to be about. And we get a chance to give God glory right now with the resources and the tools that he's given us, knowing that this is a short time. So we don't live in fear. We don't live with trepidation. We live with hope. We live with joy. The Apostle John wrote this in Revelation 14, 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. You get to be written about after you die. Like, blessed are those who die in the Lord. This is a celebration. Why? Because they're getting to go home. Eternity is next. Amen. The hymn writer Fanny Crosby said this, and I'll close with this thought. Fanny Crosby wrote over 6,000 gospel songs. I can't imagine that. That's a lot of writing. Some of them, if I were to list some of them, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that was hers. That was hers. Yeah. There's a lot of songs that she wrote. She was blind from an illness at the age of six weeks old. She never became bitter. And one time a preacher sympathetically remarked, I think it is such a great pity that the master did not give you sight when he has showered you with so many other great gifts. And she replied quickly, do you know that if at birth, if I had been able to make one petition it would have been that I would be born blind. Why? This clergyman asked. 
Because when I get to heaven, the very first face that I will ever gladden me is to see Jesus. If you need to surrender to Jesus at all, and you need to call him Lord and Savior, if you need to be baptized, if you need to be prayed for, if you'd like to join this church, you are more than welcome to come at this time as we stand and sing. Oceans rise and thunders roar.